Hey, how are you guys doing? My next special guest is Chris Espley on the Kevin Devani Connection Show. Uh, Chris um, was on a uh, on a podcast with Robert Breedlove uh, where they discussed, you know, Eric Weinstein's appearance in Joe Rogan, and you know, and but they're discussing uh, the societal problems Weinstein had identified, but with a Bitcoinist perspective. So uh, they went into the rabbit hole, and you know, you can consider this talk, which I'm really excited about. Um, as a sort of an extension uh, into further tangents and rabbit holes of Bitcoin, some fundamental or maybe even ignored questions or topics which I, which I have not been emphasized enough. And so without further ado, this is my talk Chris Espley. Make sure you follow me on Twitter. And if you have any questions or comments, suggestions, let me know. My email address is kd at kevandavani.com or DM me. Make sure you subscribe to my YouTube channel and podcast platform. So enjoy this show. Uh, enjoy this episode. Hey, Chris, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for your time. Uh, really my pleasure. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm good, thanks. Thanks for having me, Kevan. Uh, it's, yeah, it's a lovely sunny day here in uh, in the northwest of England, which we don't get many of. So, yeah, yeah, we don't live in Austria. It's pretty gray at the moment. So yeah. <laughs> really looking forward to summer. So Chris, uh, I really enjoyed your talk with Robert Breedlove. Um, it's it's amazing, your insightful knowledge. And this is why, why I want to ask you, you know, maybe introduce yourself a little bit to my listeners. Like, what's your background? Like, how, how did you, because I, I, I think you, have I mean, not only have obviously read a lot of books and, you know, went deep into the rabbit hole with its Bitcoin or beyond, but can you tell them a little bit about yourself, please? Yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, from the northwest of England, um, kind of in some ways the typical pleb story. Like uh, had a you know a, a typical fiat job, as you might say. Um, yeah, and uh, went to university uh, and studied psychology, um, which soon became quite useless after I left university. For for a, a little while, I thought about going into academia. Because I liked the sort of um, the more research focused side of it, but um, yeah, after university, I decided to try out the sort of the private sector first, um, and kind of enjoyed like the the pace um, of that world a little bit more, and just the fact that yeah, I, I guess it was the pace really, and just uh, academia. I guess when I was going through my degree, um, something always niggled at me, and and I think what I enjoyed about um, the kind of research, more research focused side of psychology was really just the, the kind of ability to sit down and think about stuff like for a, for quite a while and to, and to sit with it. I didn't really actually enjoy the, uh, the subject matter all that much. Um, so yeah, fast forward, um, a few years, I only started going down the Bitcoin rabbit hole in about 2017, late 2017. So um, my journey with Bitcoin actually started in 2013. So while I was at university um, in 2013, uh, I was like, uh, I was in my overdraft, uh, you know, so an indebted student. I had a job, but it was only like a bar job that only needed me like once a week or something. Um, and at some point during my last year of university, um, I... Uh, I received the security deposit back from the house that I'd lived in, in the previous year. And it was about 300 pounds. So, you know, to someone who's in the, a student who's in their overdraft, that's quite a bit of money. Now that the responsible thing to do would have just been to, you know, let it pay off a chunk of your overdraft, carried on working my bar job and tried to get back to sort of break even. But um, instead I'd heard about this Bitcoin thing that had recently run up in price uh, and was on the news for all sorts of reasons. Um, so, and I'd been looking into it a little bit that, that year uh, to see honestly, just whether it was worth like a speculative gamble. Um, and then I received that kind of chunk of money back about 300 pounds. Um, and I decided that rather than let all of that pay off my, you know, just go towards paying off my overdraft, I would use a chunk of it and buy some of this Bitcoin thing I'd heard about. So I bought a quarter of a Bitcoin uh, for just over a hundred pounds. Imagine that, um, the good old days. <laughs> but um, yeah, I didn't actually go down the rabbit hole at that point. It, it was kind of like, it was just a speculative gamble for me. Um, I didn't understand much of what it, what a, an, a, an investment in Bitcoin 
represented or anything like that. And it, so, yeah, at, at that point, it didn't really, um, I didn't go down the rabbit hole. However, in late 2017, when Bitcoin starts hitting the news again, because the price is um, running up again, um, I w- what it did do is that I now had skin in the game and I really had kind of uh, an incentive to, to learn about it because I actually, I was already invested in this thing. Um, so, yeah, then... So it's late 2017. I'm uh, I've moved just moved to Moscow at this point. So um, me and my partner lived there for uh, a couple of years, um, teaching English basically. Uh, yeah, just as an interesting place to spend a couple of years in our twenties. Um, so yeah, I, I've got all the all my details written down somewhere, and I don't know. I don't know what a private key is. I don't know what a seed phrase is. I don't know whether I've got like some custodial wallet or, or whatever. I remember just writing down all the details, putting them away. And I just essentially just forgot about them for four years. But yeah, anyway, in late, in early 2018, I get home and realize I've got all the, uh, the Bitcoin that I had bought. And I think I'd since bought more. Um, but yeah, but at this point, I just started diving down the rabbit hole. And honestly, like since then, early 2018, <clears throat> it's kind of been, the main thing that like occupies my focus, at, you know, outside of work and things I sort of have to learn about, um, Bitcoin became like the thing I would read about at every every blog, every tweet, every uh, podcast. I'd hoover up, um, yeah. And more recently, I've been going down like back to first principles in terms of like the Austrian economics. Um, you know, uh, I've just bought Human Action by Mises. Uh, I read Economics in One Lesson by Hazlitt. Um, Isn't that like religion. the classical journey? I'm sorry to interrupt you, Chris, but what I'm really curious, like um, just a quick question uh, before I forget that question. Um, in 2013, so when you first you know, got in touch with Bitcoin, did you understand the first time like the fundamental monetary properties of Bitcoin? You know, there's like OGs or like Max Kaiser who like, you know, they un- just understood the absolute scarcity of it. Like what did you or did you what is just for fun, you know, for speculative reasons? Yeah, pretty much just speculation. Um, I can't really remember. Uh, all I remember from that time in terms of the research I did before making that investment was uh, mostly reading the Bitcoin talk forum um and the reddit the subreddit but the problem back then was with posts on a forum or posts on reddit you don't really know who's saying it and you don't have much context about the person other than a username with things like twitter and youtube now you get a lot more context about the person who's making these claims um which is kind of a signal of their credibility in some ways like uh you know, it, if they have more followers, that's one piece of signal. Uh, if they work for a legit company, that's one piece of signal. If they've done interviews in the past, that's more signal. You, you can kind of evaluate whether this person really knows what they're talking about. But back then, yeah, it was just pseudonymous posts on forums, really. So, I, yeah, I didn't have the fundamental understanding, um, didn't understand Bitcoin's monetary uh, qualities, Um but I guess, you know, that, that was quite a bit of money to me back then. So I guess it must have passed my kind of BS detector test. But that's about it. <laughs> it's amazing. Amazing journey. So, Chris, um, let me ask you, um, let's go into the talk with Robert Breedlove, which, uh, which I have to re-listen every time because it's so much, uh, so much comprehension to digest. You said at one point, I think it was pretty in the beginning that, uh, you know, I mean, it's, uh, you know, the whole, the whole episode is sort of built or, or, or dedicated to Eric Weinstein, uh, uh, if I may pr- pronounce his name correctly. I think it's Weinstein uh, because it's a, a Stein, Stein means stone in German. So, <laughs> so um, you said sometime in the beginning, you said that, you know, it, it wasn't like uh, particularly like uh, about Eric Weins, but it, it was like the, it, I guess he's, you know, part of the boomer generation. But um, is it, I mean, he's, a, you know, like like Jordan Peterson, Dr. Jordan Peterson, and others, you know, intellectual gurus, really huge brains uh, that like people like Eric Weins never 
had this. I'm, I'm hope I'm hoping I'm paraphrasing this, but he, uh, that he never got like the pain point, or that he never, you know, uh, experienced. Um, what it what it what it is like to live, you know, in in the fiat system, something like that. Is that is that mm. something I'm paraphrasing correctly? I'm not not sure. Yeah, I think that's fair. Um, yeah, I think it's partly. So this is partly an age thing, um, but not certainly not exclusively. Um, yeah, and breathe level and I acknowledge that. Essentially, what what we what we're saying is that there are some people for whom the system, inflationary monetary system um has worked quite well so um yeah I'm, I'm sure your listeners will um be familiar but for the small number that aren't we can essentially say that um money used to have some sense some kind of intrinsic value um and this is what the era of the gold standard was back in the era of the gold standard uh the value of uh, national currencies was tied to the value of gold so essentially you could redeem any moment at any time you wanted to you could redeem your you know your pounds your uh, marks or francs or whatever for their given value in gold um from a from from a bank um which yeah gave them an intrinsic value and essentially what what would happen during this era was um and eras before it if depositors so people who um were keeping their savings with some commercial bank began to suspect that that bank might be running um, a fractional reserve and you know that undermined their kind of uh perceived ability to pay back your savings then there'd be what what would be called a bank run and people would uh, withdraw all of their holdings and that bank would would go into difficulties and possibly go bankrupt so it was a way it was a kind of decentralization of the banking industry in one sense um because commercial banks were were you know uh kept individuals uh kept the value of their deposit is gold kind of back. Um, and yeah, it was also a check on the central power, the, the government that issued these national currencies because they couldn't print more money at will and they're, thereby increasing their spending power. Um, what we have essentially had since, you could say the early 20th century, um, when the first countries began to go off the gold standard around the beginning of World War One, uh, and the uh, federal fourteen or fourteen, one of those years, um, is essentially greater and greater money in circulation, um, greater and greater leverage in the bank banking system, a greater and greater like fractional reserve. So, I recently heard. Uh, so, uh, around the time of the financial crisis, I believe. Um, banks were required to have on hand one tenth the value of their um, depositors' uh, assets. So it was like for for every uh, every one pound deposited with them, they can lend out nine or ten. Um, recently, during the COVID crash, um, those uh, requirements in the US, at least, and perhaps elsewhere were completely removed so it's just, it's essentially it's greater and greater leverage in the financial system it's governments being able to um print more money at will it's uh it's society society's money getting further and further away from having this intrinsic objective standard of value um and yeah it's my talk with Breedler was all about the pernicious negative downstream effects of that. Um, and essentially, because this has been happening to a greater and greater extent over time, those who are kind of uh, growing up now are going to be more affected by it than those who are slightly older. For example, and one of the reasons of this is because... Um, one of the things that 
printing more money does and there being more leverage in the financial system does is props up the value of assets. There's now more currency around to uh, to buy each individual asset. So the value, the purchasing power of each unit of the currency has decreased um, amongst other things, but that's kind of the, the most direct way of putting it. Um, yeah, so part of this is generational and it means that those who are older are less affected by it or perhaps have benefit benefited from it because they bought houses back in the 70s, 80s and have seen the value, as, value of those things rise, like my parents, for example. Whereas those who are kind of coming later now, perhaps they're only now thinking about buying their first house, perhaps they're in their 20s or 30s, uh, they are dealing with the, the implications and the ramifications of decade after decade of this loose monetary policy. And what we see is that this affects people's life chances. Um, it affects people's quality of life. It affects people's empowerment. So people like to, you know, economists like to say that there is little to no inflation because they use consumer the consumer price index, um, which, yeah, that is kind of a cherry picked basket of goods and which many of which are subject, subject to technological deflation at the same time as monetary inflation. So prices remain kind of stable. Whereas if you think about the things you actually want to buy and that most affect your quality of life, so education perhaps, a house is another one, they're kind of my big two. Those things have got more and more expensive over time. And what that means is, the younger you are, the more you are affected by this, the more expensive those things become. And uh, there's a great piece that Arthur, Arthur Hayes, one of the founders of BitMEX wrote, in which he said, the symptoms of inflation are riots, uh, civil unrest, uh, lack of institutional trust and uh, food shortages. I haven't seen food so shortages yet. I, ho I hope we don't. But essentially, it's making the point that you, while you don't necessarily, while it's difficult to quantify inflation, you can certainly see the kind of qualitative and the lived effects of it. And when you see things like birth rates among millennials, um, I mean, that's another cause for alarm. And for me, all of this is down, downstream of the money, because having this inflationary monetary paradigm, which ostensibly... Um, is what it, what kind of um, shapes our way of life, uh, the pension system, the welfare state, and uh, and things like this. All of these things, all of these institutions, are propped up by the inflationary monetary system, and because people like to think in kind of terms of the state, about social justice, about um, looking after the poor within society and the, the disadvantaged within society, they think of those things in terms of how the state can achieve their objectives it's difficult for people to see it because you start to advocate for this thing which will take that power away from the state people don't like change and um it sounds like you're advocating for taking away a lot of the the things that look after us but actually a, a complete conversation around the money has to deal with the unintended negative effects of monetary intervention government intervention in the money supply, printing more money. Um, and in, in mainstream um, economics and mainstream media, this just doesn't happen. So if you want that kind of thing, you have to listen to podcasts like this. And then I'm sure you're familiar with the, uh, you know, with this great website or, you know, the, the platform of what the, what the fuck happened in 1971 uh, by Ben Prentice and heavily armed clown. And, you know, it shows, of course, you know, you could say correlation is not causation, but it is like you, you can see like the cascading effects, the catastrophic effects on everything. You know, as you said, whatever that is, birth rates, divorce rates. I mean, it has so many effects down, downstream on everything, you know, whether it's food production or health or education or, you know, the brainwashing of children or the systematic destruction of the creativity of children, uh, you know, because it, these are topics which are also very concerning to me and my girlfriend because we have a three month old uh, baby now. And it's it's like, in what kind of world uh, is she gonna live, you know, grow up uh, in? But what I was gonna ask you, you know, let's, let's just stick, you know, to Eric Weinstein, other, you know, intellectual gurus, 
Have you ever heard, because I'm, I'm not like, a, I mean, I've listened to some podcasts, you know, with Joe Rogan and, and even Joe Rogan, you know, when, when, when Eric, it's funny when Eric Weinstein, some of the, you know, uses a lot of intellectual words or word salad, as we say, and I don't understand, you know, shit. And, and Joe Rogan is like, what the fuck are you talking about? You know, so it's like, have you ever heard like people like Eric Weinstein or Jordan Peterson talk about the, the root problem, like the, the structural problem we have with, uh, because this is a topic which really is of high interest to me, how the central bank derives its legitimacy, what, you know, their, their criminal immunity, their, their untouchability, their unaccountability. Of course, you know, you could say in collusion with the government or the government being instrumentalized by the central banks, whatever, you know, however it works. Have you ever heard a discussion going into the course, uh, you know, of, 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 of all everything that's, you know, that is, uh, that is surrounding us. No, I haven't ever heard that um, amongst any of these people, really. I think there are a few, when you kind of listen to what people say about Bitcoin, you can tell whether they properly understand it or not. Um, with Weinstein, I'd love, uh, he, so he, he's engaging quite a bit with Bitcoiners on Clubhouse, I believe. Um, yeah, and hopefully he'll come on a, a few Bitcoin podcasts soon. I think the problem for, for Weinstein specifically is that he, he, ha he kind of has these like theories of grand theories of everything. And he likes to fit phenomena into them. Uh, and like we all do, I guess. Um, but with his model, I don't think it kind of, I think he would kind of need to go back to first principles on a few things um, with regards to money and economics. Um, so speaking about Breedlove, I watched his episode with Lex Friedman uh, the other day, uh, yesterday, I think, or yeah. most of it. Yeah, it was a great episode. Because I said, but yeah. to be honest, I'm, not, I'm still not sure whether Lex Friedman got it after like four hours, I'm still not sure, you know, whether he's like, you know, this, 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 this enlightenment, you know, which, which you have, you know, when it's like, oh, wow, this is, this is like evolutionary, you know? Yeah. I, th the thing with Lex is I would back him to get it over time because I think he's engaging with it earnestly, honestly, and with humility. I think he comes into conversations like with Breedlove, with Nick Carter, didn't listen to his one with Pomp, um, but yeah, he's, he clearly comes into these conversations with an open mind and is willing to have his mind changed and have his worldview fundamentally reshaped. And that is what you need to be able to see Bitcoin because it's this first principles thing that actually suggests a lot that a lot of your worldview is incorrect, wrong, out of date, um, or soon to become obsolete. As Bitcoiners, you know, if you weren't already, uh, say, uh, the Max Kaisers of the world, the uh, the Bitstein, the Pierre, Pierre Richards of the world, who were already thinking a lot about some of these things, uh, whether it's Austrian economics or it's the corruption of the money and finance in the case of Max Kaiser. If you weren't already thinking about these things before, you know, 2009 or whenever you first heard of Bitcoin, then you won't get it the first time you see it. And actually your process of going down the rabbit hole will be characterized by these periods of being uncomfortable with the implications of what you're learning about. And it, it takes humility. It takes, you know, the, the overcoming of your ego. Um, it takes not being too attached to your, your model of the world and your frameworks for viewing the world um, to be able to see it. In the case of Lex Friedman, let's say I'm bullish on him <laughs> because I think he'll get it. I, I don't think he's not someone who's like kind of of an activist mind. He's he's kind of like permanently open minded, I would say. So I don't think he'll ever like come out and be like this re, this huge advocate for Bitcoin. The, the best we can hope for is what he's currently doing now and just keep getting Bitcoiners on his platform to to use his platform for bit for the Bitcoin course. Um yeah, and I'm bullish that that will keep happening. In the case of guys like, um, yeah, Weinstein, uh, he, I see him talk talk about Bitcoin, and it's clear to me that he still doesn't get it from first principles. Um, and 
I don't know. Not everybody's going to, but yeah, I, I would love, I would love him to, to be able to get it because he's someone with a, he's someone who is open-minded and uh, kind of non-partisan and people who are also like that listeners who are like that or people within his audience who are like that seek him out for his insight because he's like that. Um, and it's that group, it's that group who Bitcoin, um, could get to, uh, a lot of people will just never see it until it it's too late or until it's happened to them. Um, because they're, they're just too tied into the, the, the current system. Um, and unwilling to like reconsider their worldview from from first principles. Jordan Peterson, um, I'd say I'm fairly bullish on him. He's he engaged uh, on Twitter a few times. His daughter quite deeply gets it, I think, um, and it, it just fits. It maps onto his value system so well. Um, I haven't read his books, but I have. Um, I've got one of his books, uh, Maps of Meaning, that, that I will read at some point. Uh, and I've listened to him on a few podcasts and interviews and what have you. Um, and it's clear that, like, you know, self-determination and, um, you know, individual responsibility and resilience and what have you, uh, Bitcoin fits with his value system. So, yeah, I'd, I'd be bullish on him getting it as well. Um I, I suspect at some point he'll, um, perhaps when he's done with his first round of uh, promoting his new book, um, perhaps then he'll, he'll start to engage with the Bitcoin crowd um, on podcasts and what have you. But um, yeah, so a lot of these guys don't get it for reasons of ego. Some don't get it because they want to uh, fit everything to the way they currently see the world um and others uh and others just i don't know don't have the brain power or the aren't willing to go back to first principles what i will say though is um someone who clearly does get it and it is also kind of in a league with with those uh guys those kind of non-partisan think outside the box respected thinkers of that generation uh peter teal he gets it very very deeply we're just going to address address yeah. PTO's zero to one, but go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, so he um, all along. So in 2017, he was uh, using the the Bitcoin as digital gold analogy, and this was around the time of the like uh, ICO phenomenon. And I was someone who got like I was loaded up on shit coins at one point. Um, so you know, even people who who do get it and did get it fell down, uh, you know, that rabbit hole a little bit. He, he may, I don't think he, he was involved. He, he may have been involved with a, a few projects, but not like, he's basically someone who's kind of always been pretty much maximalist, Bitcoin maximalist. He certainly is now. Um, and there's um, interviews with him in 2017 when he's cautioning against um, a lot of ICO projects and things that aren't Bitcoin. Um, more recently, he's spoken about, uh, so in, in January of this year, there was a podcast, um, I forget which institution it was with or what the podcast was called, but, um, he, he basically says his, the asset he's most bullish on and the kind of counterintuitive advice that he'd give for investing advice that he'd give for the next decade is just buy Bitcoin, um, that, that's someone who, who kind of understands the monetary system and the investing landscape from first principles, right? Because there's a guy, um, you know, he, he, yeah, he, well, he's a billionaire. Uh, he's probably diversified across a lot of asset classes, but and yet here he is saying just buy Bitcoin. And the other thing is his comments recently about um, uh, the, the U.S., should think about he was advocating that the us should think about um the fact that china clearly seemed to be adopting bitcoin in some ways um and what that means for the us is what he said in kind of a, a cloak and daggers kind of way now some people took this to mean like you know he was spreading fud um 
fear, uncertainty, uncertainty, doubt, and uh, you know, going the old trope. Oh, what if the government bans Bitcoin or whatever? Some thought, oh, is Teal advocating for banning Bitcoin? And then others came out with takes like, no, he's playing 4D chess. Like he wants the US to see it. Um, and I'm always skeptical of those takes because a lot of the time, like people kind of like project super intelligence or super um, forethought onto people that they like and respect. But in the case of Teal's comments on Bitcoin and its geopolitical significance, uh, I think those takes were, were spot on. I, I think Teal deeply gets it. I think he is someone who is, um, he's kind of, he's somehow in a league, isn't he, through Palantir with like, yeah, it's a little bit shady stuff with national security intelligence uh, uh, <laughs> issues, but 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 you know it's the way he formulated it in in like in one sentence, like he is he declared himself as a Bitcoin maximalist, actually, yeah. right? And and on the other hand, he says uh, it was. I mean, that's my interpretation. You know, it's like, hey, this is this is the true opportunity. You know, for the national security of the United States, right? <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's an acknowledgement. Um, and a, a recommendation that the U.S. establishment begins to see Bitcoin as, um, yeah, as something with geopolitical significance. So, so much of the world these days is uh, shaped by the petrodollar. Um, so, yeah, beginning in. So we, we've spoken about moving off the gold standard. This was a, a trend uh, that's played out since the beginning of the 20th century, you might say. Um, you could go back a bit further than that and look at like the gradual centralization of gold um, in the uh, the national central banks, which allowed uh, nations to devalue their currency because they now had a, a monopoly on the gold supply and were issuing their banknotes uh, in place of gold. Um, but yeah. So that has been the trend since, let's say, the early 20th century. But really, our modern monetary paradigm uh, began post-World War II, so in 1945, and then proper in 1971, as we've said. Um, yeah, and essentially, at the end, towards the end of World War II, 1944, I think, um, when the US was basically the only, it was the single global superpower, it was the only superpower whose like uh, economy wasn't in ruins because of uh, World War Two, and um, yeah, it, it was growing a, a very fast pace. Um, I, it probably now had the largest military, um, so you know the the new world was theirs to shape. I remember seeing like um, the U after World War Two the. the US GDP, I think it was, was it GDP, uh, was like multiples higher. Or it, this is at least true. US GDP at that time was bigger than all of the other economies combined, I believe. Um, it put them in a position of immense strength. And what they used it to do was establish a kind of like soft empire through uh their control over the money supply. And what they essentially said was like, okay, we're going to shape the rules. We have everybody's gold because a lot of you sent it to us during World War II for safekeeping. What we'll do is we'll start this new system where um, in the same way that um, citizens' money used to be redeemable for gold at their local commercial bank or the central bank, now... The U.S. has all the gold, so it's you know become further centralized. The gold supply, and uh, the gold will be redeemable for U.S. dollars, but only to foreign governments, like not to citizens, only to governments. Um, and they use their status as the global, the issuer of the global reserve currency, to say, okay, we are now going to be like the global steward around trade. We're we're now going to basically make the rules of global trade, expect everybody to opt into this system. And in return for you opting into this system, we will protect these rules and we'll protect like global shipping lanes. Um, the 
what that has given the 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 US the power to do over the years is uh, shape global trade and geopolitical reality uh, to serve their interests. Um, and a lot of the the wars over the past, I don't know, half century, uh, have actually been, and not just wars, but military intervention. I don't think you'd call um, like NATO intervention in Libya a war, but like France carried out uh, airstrikes on Libya in like 2011, for example. Um, that, along with uh, the Iraq war in 03, um, seems to have been about protecting this petrodollar system and the US's single uh, global reserve power. Um, because in each of those countries, uh, the leader, Saddam Hussein and Gaddafi, respectively, um, had earlier decided to stop selling their oil uh, for dollars and instead do so for euros. And uh, yeah, there seems to be a pattern, would... right, Chris? There seems to be yeah. a pattern every time, you know, someone yeah. will oh, yeah. go after international, the dominant international reserve currency, the dot, you know, so. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Oh, uh, you want to sell your dollar, for sell your oil for something other than Europe, for something other than dollars? Sounds like you need some freedom. <laughs> I love that line. There is. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Chris, I want to go back to this tangent because it's really fascinating. It's one of the most fascinating. It's actually the reason I'm into Bitcoin. Um, you know, you mentioned now Peter Thiel. You, we talked about Lex Friedman. We talked about Jordan Peterson. It's not about the figures or, you know, the, the, these guru figures, but it's like the, the values, the visions, you know, the, the intelligence they carry within themselves and what they talk about. And, you know, and I'm trying like to not only for myself, but for, for, you know, for the, for the audience out there to con maybe help them connect the dots. You know, I always imagine what if they did their homework? What if they read each other's work, for example, whatever uh, Jordan Peterson or Eric Weinstein or Peter Thiel reading, uh, you know, your works, you know, whatever, or Robert Breedlove's work, and they would sit together at, on Joe Rogan once they really collectively understood what, what the true power and essence of Bitcoin, what it would mean for the scientific technological evolution you know for example eric weinstein i know I, I listened to that passage where he says um i think it was on joe rogan right where he says you know how the the the, the stuff he published or the research is done is somehow being suppressed i mean it's, it's a systematic thing that's been going on in every other field you can think of you know the suppression uh, of of science uh, uh, the manipulation of 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 science the scientific fraud um so, but what I'm getting, what I'm getting at is like the potential for scientific and technological evolution. The thinking zero to one, you know, Peter Thiel's terminology. What not only the digital realm, because there's so much focus on the digital realm, right? When you listen to Michael Saylor or Peter Thiel, I'm like, you know, on the fundamental technologies which hasn't, which haven't been really advancing. You know, with it be transportation, energy production, energy conversion. Um, you know, whatever that is, you know, not only on, in AI and robotics, I mean, they're super advanced. If you look at Boston Dynamics, but I'm like, how can we serve, you know, humanity with these fundamental technologies, which can be once the, the, these, the economy and the whole structure is rooted in Bitcoin and the central banks have been obsoleted and, you know, this whole centralized structures have been obsoleted. I'm, I'm trying, you know, to make people understand the power of Bitcoin, what it can mean for the daily life of the human being. What's your take on that? Yeah, so I think there's two dimensions or aspects to this. Um, and one is about decentralization of power um, in the economy, in governance, in just about every industry you can think of. Um, and the other is um, like the kind of the way that not ha the way that having money not have any objective value um kind of untethers you from reality so that you're not yeah you're not anchored to reality anymore um and the way that affects your priorities so yeah i look at two of those kind of mega trends you could say um and yeah those implications of bitcoin separately they kind of overlap, but sort of separately. Um, yeah, 
with the kind of meta point being that what Bitcoin will do is drive decentralization in the economy uh, over governance and what have you. Um, it will also transition us for a, from a debt-based to a savings-based society, uh, which is nat naturally more decentralized. Um, and then the other side of that being um, Bitcoin through um, moving us back to a hard monetary standard and a sound monetary standard will empower humanity to kind of prior prioritize properly because it will, um, yeah, just kind of put certain natural economic forces like creative destruction uh, back it will just unleash them again, essentially. It'll put us back on track. So the first side of that, uh, centralization, decentralization. So the monetary system that we have props up all of our institutions. So you can think of money as like the base layer of society. So what do humans do? What kind of separates us from other animals and what has enabled us to create the civilization that we have? Um, it's our ability to communicate and our ability to transact um, and exchange value. You, you could kind of look at this as it, it's our ability to exchange information and our ability to exchange value. Um, exchanging value is all about, sorry, in in exchanging information is all about you know language, body language, uh, being able to speak to one another, communicate, collaborate, and that kind of thing. Um, and our ability to believe, see, think about, believe in the abstract. So we can kind of um, believe in shared stories and that gives us the ability to uh, collaborate across genetic boundaries because we subscribe to some identity or religion. Uh, so it's not just like our uh, brothers, sisters, closely genetically related um, kin that we cooperate with we can cooperate in in larger numbers when you look at uh, what the internet was it was a revolution in us being able to exchange uh, information online so all of a sudden we can exchange information in a way that is kind of geographically agnostic you know if i send an email it doesn't care whether you're in australia or the us it's or, or sat right next to me it's the same experience um so those Geographical boundaries to the exchange of information have been uh, removed, and we've you know we've kind of lived the last twenty years um, the implications of that and how uh, significant that that has been. Um, yeah, Bitcoin does a similar thing in terms of uh, the way we exchange value. Um, so, in the same way that the internet has moved, like <clears throat> communities identity culture online bitcoin will move economies online and the same kind of uh, you could call it a mega trend of geographical reality national borders becoming less relevant to the exchange of information and the implications that has had um the same thing will happen for value uh, that will change the financial system it will change uh uh it will change governance, it will change change everything. So money, which sits at the base layer of society, um, has become geographically independent. So a lot of those institutions that are built on a geographically dependent money, monetary system and, and the way that shapes society, um, have kind of had the rug pulled out from underneath them. Um, and it's just the next step in the evolution of society nothing's static in human civilization things always change uh, we move from hunter-gatherer societies in which we roamed around in small groups to ag agricultural societies in which we settled um, to industrial societies in which we settled in greater density um, there were greater returns to economies of scale it drove a centralization in in capital uh, in the economy and what have you we're now moving to another stage of human civilization um, and it's being driven by information technology uh, and semiconductor and digital technology uh, and it will fundamentally reshape reality, that base layer of civilization 
and it will reshape everything that, that kind of comes above it with an exponential speed yeah and also say, right? in terms of with a you know by order perhaps, magnitude, yeah is that something that when people, i listen uh maybe not wired you know uh, people's brains are really not wired you know for this exponential not only growth but like evolution or development you know yeah certainly um Jeff Booth, other Silicon Valley types talk about this exponential growth. It seems to be, you know, that uh, new technologies popping up into our lives every so often. Um, that seems to be happening at, happening at a faster pace. So yeah, that, that could, could quite possibly um, characterize the experience of this new age. Um, but yeah, I guess all of this to say, the money being at this base layer of civilization. I've covered the technological. I'll just cover the kind of um, inflation versus deflation thing. Talking about this base layer uh, of civilization, you can think of like the civilizational stack. Uh, the institutions are on top. The money, the way we exchange value is at the bottom and it affects everything above it. Um, so yeah, we've spoken about the way that money will change technologically and the fact that it will become uh geographically agnostic and the implications of that that will change things uh, but there's also the fact that bitcoin will move us back to this hard monetary standard sound monetary standard where money once again has an objective standard of value because in bitcoin the inflation schedule is set nobody can create any more um there's this term when to describe people within the fiat system who benefit from inflation more than others. Uh, the, the Cantillon Insider, um, named after the, the person who first described it, I think, which is basically that there are people who benefit more from inflation than others in society. But in Bitcoin, there are no Cantillon Insiders because um, everybody, nobody's in a, a privileged position over anybody else. Um, it means that government's power over monetary policy uh, will gradually uh, disintegrate. And yeah, the, the, so monetary policy, it shapes all of our national institutions. It, it keeps them national in a way. What the, um, these trends uh, that are driven by digital technolo technologies, it, it Inherent within them is a, a trend towards decentralization. If you think about the equal, equalized access to like building an audience, um, entrepreneurship and what have you, what these digital net technologies naturally drive is a decentralization of opportunity, of economic power and what have you. These national institutions are kind of standing in, in the way of that and <laughs> employing all sorts of tricks to kind of keep themselves relevant in a time when technology, not just Bitcoin, um, will inevitably render, render them Ill, irrelevant or at least less relevant. Now, bringing it back to um, the way that the money uh, affect, bringing it back to your question about science and technology and progress. Um, one of the things that I guess let's take the two sides of that. So there's the technological implications of Bitcoin, which again are driving this um, these, this force towards uh, decentralization and equal access to, towards participation in the global economy, um, the exchange of value and what have you. Um, that will simply empower more entrepreneurs in more different contexts. Um, right now it feels like, or at least around the smartphone, most of the technological innovation was coming from one place. It was Silicon Valley in the US, it would seem, or at least it, it felt like that. Um, I think one of the things that Bitcoin will change through moving us towards this digital monetary paradigm uh, is more people iterating, more people innovating in different contexts, in different industries all around the world. Um, and I mean, that is uh, fundamentally bullish for humanity, for technology, for progress. Um, the other side of that, that monetary point um, is uh, it will help us to kind of uh, reprioritize. 
So with what we essentially get, the academic institutions of the day, the leading academic institutions of the day, their priorities, um, they, they're a major kind of capital allocator when it comes to um, science, innovation, discovery, what have you. And their incentives are shaped by government and government's power is propped up by the money, uh, the power over monetary policy. Uh, and they're accountable to a democracy um, who are kind of becoming incre increasingly detached from reality because th they never have to face um, the kind of implications of their decisions. Because wh whenever we reach like a period of economic difficulty, we just turn on the monetary taps. So we print more money or the government intervenes via mon monetary policy. Um, and so our cultural priorities over time separate from reality to the point where, you know, people can kind of, what we have now with uh, certain elements of modern thought is like, people will look at like the whole of Western history as being some evil thing. Um, which really just doesn't make any sense on any level. Um, it's very kind of like Maoist. Uh, it's very communist, like, yeah, this break from history and tradition, uh, it's, it's concerning, but it can happen when a, a population doesn't have to face up to the implications of its decisions for generation after generation. Because what should happen is your poor decisions will lead to, um, poor like uh, prioritization in the way you allocate capital um, it will lead to poor economic decisions and that, that will have economic implications and it's, it should be this feedback loop where okay we got that wrong this way in which we're thinking or this industry that, that thinks a certain way isn't flourishing that goes to zero that dies off we get back on track but because we've broken that feedback loop because government has power over monetary policy and that whenever we hit economic difficulty, we we don't get the feedback because governments just print more money to like um, prolong the sugar high. Yeah, it, it causes a um, poor prioritization on a kind of a kind of uh, within the democracy, within the people that manifests itself in poor kind of uh, yeah capital allocation. Uh, incentivization prioritization at the level of government and that all manifests itself in uh, these poor decisions within the academic institutions i would actually say that academic institutions have it worst because they um they're just kind of the the least removed the most removed from like the market and market incentives so in the uk um there's a cap on tuition fees, which is like nine thousand pounds per year. Um, in the late nineties, it was it, tuition fees were free, um, subsidised by the taxpayer, I guess. Uh, in the early two thousands, I think they went to three thousand pounds. That's what I paid. Now they're at nine thousand pounds, and essentially, as a, an academic institution, you are going to get the money from government that you get every year you are going to get the money from um, students every year because they need to pay for it to access like a, a decent life. Um, and at no point do you kind of uh, face the implications of what you're prioritizing within your university. So how much you're allocating to engineering, how much you're allocating to the other um, STEM subjects, how much you're allocating to humanities, um how much you're kind of um you know the, the way that you're kind of the culture that you're fostering within your institution yeah all of the, all of this is downstream of the money and it's the the yeah the downstream effects of governments having power over monetary policy and across society but particularly in the academic institutions it results in a kind of misprioritization because at no point do the people, politicians, or decision makers within universities deal with the ramifications of their decisions because you don't get, because we've broken the feedback loop. Whenever we reach this period of, a period of economic difficulty, 
which might um, suggest that universities, for example, need to reprioritize. You're not producing a workforce that has the right skills. That resonates with me because I feel like I reached the workforce and it was like, okay, forget everything you've ever learned at university. Now we're going to teach you how things really are. And yeah, just bringing it back to science and technology and progress, I think getting the universities to be functioning, adaptive um, institutions once again with their priorities straight can only result in, in good things for innovation and progress and research and what have you. It, it will reform the culture of these institutions. It will disrupt these institutions as well, because I think we're going to we're going to see new competitors to universities because digital technology can kind of replicate a lot of their functions, particularly into, around teaching. Um, so it, it might be that that. So right now, academic institutions are both teaching and research institutions. It might be that to some extent those things separate. I don't know, but. Yeah, the downstream effects of Bitcoin, to wrap this up and put a bow on it, um, are, are so huge across whether it's uh, implications for humanity and uh, across civilization, uh, you know, taking away a lot of the government's power and restoring it to the people, um, restoring these economic feedback loops so that we, uh, you know, we kind of re-facilitate these processes of creative destruction, which um, can be bad and scary for individual risk takers, individual entrepreneurs, but benefit us as a whole. Um, whether it's yeah, getting the academic institutions to reprioritize the things that really matter because they're now accountable to the economic phenomena that they uh, create uh, or, or don't create. Um, yeah, across society, the, the implications of Bitcoin are just absolutely mind blowing. Um, and yeah, the the ones that I'm most bullish on uh, are often around, yeah, the, the reprioritization of things that matter, uh, the decentralization of power within society. Um, yeah, the equalization of economic opportunity, uh, the, the kind of taking away the or restoring young people's life chances because you, you don't keep, um, yeah, the, this inflationary par paradigm doesn't keep adding zeros to the value of assets, thus removing their ability to be able to afford them. Um, yeah, and the other thing, be, moving from a, a debt-based society in which people feel chained to their nine to five job because they have so much debt, so many bills to pay, the price of housing is so high to a savings-based society where um you know the the value of your savings that you accumulate increases over time instead of de decreases so you become empowered through your savings as opposed to empowered through your job and therefore it's just a bit you're a bit more free and um i realize i'm extending the uh, implications of this but just to run with it a little bit further um a lot of the time, when you look throughout history, a lot of uh, progress in terms of thought, philosophy, engineering, science, whatever, has come from like a leisure class. So in like, a, you know, 18th century, 19th century England, for example, uh, which uh, drove a lot of uh, the Industrial Revolution and... Uh, just Western economic and philosophical thought. Um, a lot of that was done by members of the clergy. So it was people, it was like, I don't know, monks or priests who essentially were like kept men because, uh, you know, that their, uh, I guess their bills were paid by the, the, the church and they just had time to think and innovate and what have you. And I'm sure a lot of them just sat around on the backside and didn't do much. But a lot of them uh, produce really important works. Um, and what I see, and, and another way that just think, bringing it back to science, technology, progress, another implication of Bitcoin is it will just unchain a lot of people from their nine to five jobs. It will empower them through their savings. And you will want to get, again, get lots of people with the, the time and empowerment to, to sit around think about stuff, uh, 
innovate, iterate, uh, make progress, think about things that are, that are very important and, and get us away from our kind of consumerist values and, uh, yeah, and thinking about the things that matter once again. I totally agree with you. I love what, what you just said because, you know, you mentioned uh, Jeff Booth. I'm a huge fan of Jeff Booth. I had him on my show, you know, together with Titus Gable on Free Private Citizens Show, which I want to yeah, just wrap it, wrap this up uh, maybe as a final question. Um, you know, the, the abundance that it can create and the prosperity and, you know, and getting finally, you know, relieving people from this nine to five jobs, you know, they're just working just to survive, you know, and, and working, you know, paying off debts and, and just don't have the time, you know, to even think or question, you know, the, the whole, everything, you know, the narrative or, or anything or the, the, the bullshit that's been, you know, being force fed uh, through the uh, mainstream media. But, you know, finally, pe people can, can start doing things which they love, which they enjoy, which, they, you know, which is their passion, really commit themselves to and contribute something, you know, back to society, whatever that is on a creative level, scientific, technological level, educational level. So this is something which I'm really excited about. What do you think? Uh, oh, yeah, let me, let me ask you just one final question. Um, really respect your time. Um, Chris, thank you so much again for, for this talk. A really, really fascinating. What do you think is the pushback? Because you're so early, you know, we have like market capitalization of around like nothing, you know, one tenth of gold. I mean, it's still, it's not, it's not nothing, but it's, uh, it's one tenth of gold markets cap. And it's 2% of the Earth's population, you know, more or less are holding 100 million people are holding, hodling Bitcoin. Um, where do you see the challenges? Where do you see, you know, we're still talking about the monopoly on aggression, violence, uh, you know, enforcement, would it be the government, nation states, central banks? Where do you see this path unfolding? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I think one of the one of the potential um i mean all roadblocks that i foresee are on a short time frame i'm quite a deterministic thinker and when the the thinking deterministically the trend that i see playing out over long time frames is the trend towards the adoption of the hardest money so the way i like to put it People have different definitions, but I like to define money, um, as many do, as a unit of account, a medium of exchange and a store of value. Um, in order for money to uh, facilitate those functions, it needs to have certain properties, which include, for example, uh, scarcity, because you can't uh, deflate or decrease the, the purchasing power of some form of money by uh, you know finding more of it so you can't use blades of grass as currency because uh, it's trivial to go go out and find more of them uh, durability portability uh, fungibility so that one unit is interchangeable for another uh, and that uniformity so all units are equal to one another in terms of purchasing power what we see throughout history is early civilizations, primitive civilizations using uh, primitive materials as forms of like proto money, furs, animal teeth, uh, yeah, parts of animals like parts of clams, um, things like this. Uh, lots of different materials were tried, but over time money tended towards one. It tended towards gold and gold became like ultimate final settlement, settlement deified, mythologized within um, great civilizations throughout the past because they understood its importance for civilization. Um, and yeah, so it's this trend towards one and it's the trend towards the hardest money and the money which best uh, performs those three functions, the functions of money. Bitcoin, it is clear to me, uh, is now the money that best fulfills those functions. Because Bitcoin was first, because of the difficulty of solving the problems, because of just, uh, when, you, when you just understand the uh, what came before Bitcoin and like the different ingredients that Satoshi Nakamoto pulled together and wrapped around um, like the difficulty adjustment, Nakamoto consensus and things like that, 
um, to create Bitcoin, you realize that it really was like a one-time thing. Uh, be, like Silicon Valley types often like to talk about Bitcoin as perhaps, maybe this is an old narrative, but certainly in 2018, it felt like they talk about Bitcoin as like old tech or version 1.0. And that's why a lot of people turn to alternative cryptocurrencies, so to speak, um, because they don't get the, the zero to one uh, invention that Bitcoin was. They don't understand the power of Bitcoin as a shelling point. But once you do, you realize that Bitcoin is very much inevitable. So it is inevitable. However, that doesn't mean that the lived experience of a Bitcoiner is necessarily going to be rosy and without bumps in the road. So in terms of things that could get in the way, so one could be like capital controls. So in the sort of fiat system and the, the system of national currencies, um, there, when a, a country has come under economic distress, it has often introduced capital controls uh, at national borders, around national borders to prevent uh, money from, you know, people from exiting the currency into other national currencies, uh, thus undermining institutions, the government and what have you. Um, many of those are in place today. I know uh, Russia has capital controls. Argentina probably does. Uh, Venezuela probably does. China will do. Um, in the new world, we could see capital controls, but they wouldn't be around ne necessarily national borders. It would be between the physical world and the digital world. Um, which could make it difficult for individuals in certain countries to access Bitcoin. Um, I guess number one, that that's a, the case for holding your own keys if you're already in. However, most people aren't. And yeah, what this could mean is that you get this period where capital controls are, in, are introduced to prevent people exiting their currency into Bitcoin. And you could see like, just well, you will see more of the fear, uncertainty, doubt from these government institutions. Um, Bitcoin's mm -hmm. volatile; it's not stable. It has no intrinsic value. It it's boiling the oceans and all the, you know, the same rubbish we're used to hearing. Um, and that that will slow down adoption um, for people who aren't first principles thinkers and independently minded, uh, and who don't understand it um, the way that that does do um so yeah capital controls could be one uh, and it will affect people in certain countries more than others but they're ultimately doomed to fail for the reasons that i've described and for you know in terms of the evidence that we see so uh the bitcoin was recently banned in nigeria i, I think it, maybe people were banned from accessing it uh, or maybe it was just for paying for it i think they were banned from accessing it and at the very least what the government does when it signals uh, hostility towards a thing is it takes away like banks um appetite for engaging with it it's like hsbc in the uk don't let like don't let people maybe it wasn't just the uk but they don't let people hold like shares in micro strategy yeah the biggest money launderers were, uh, yeah. <laughs> one of the biggest money launderers yeah. i guess <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And and that's not because the government has banned it, but they know that um, it's the same reason that they, they don't often um, they don't offer banking services to sex workers. It's because they feel they only have a given amount, given amount of goodwill with regulators and that the next time they come up against a regulator, if they've kind of exhausted some of their goodwill because they're, uh, you know, letting people buy cryptocurrencies or whatever, um then they won't do it. So it's not necessarily always a ban. Sometimes it's just a reluctance of traditional institutions to engage and to offer certain services. Um, but yeah, in the case of Nigeria, uh, all that has happened is Bitcoin has begun to trade at a premium because now people want it more and they're willing to pay more to get it. Um, so yeah, over time, it, it's doomed to fail. Um, so yeah, things could slow down the adoption of Bitcoin. Um, there's other things I worry about, like if uh, Bitcoiners could be could perhaps be scapegoated um, if the kind of fiat monetary 
which is, well, the fiat monetary system will, will go down the drain. Maybe this is pie in the sky thinking, but I, I hope what happens is it go the Bitcoin enabled financial system grows up fast enough and the traditional fiat one uh, declines slowly enough for is replaced. You know, it, we get this nice transition. We probably won't because, it, you know, we're in the mid, we're in the midst of the late debt cycle anyway. Uh, Bitcoin isn't the catalyst for a lot of the uh, the problems and the turbulence we're going to see within society just because we are in that late debt cycle. Um, but yeah, could Bitcoiners be scapegoated? I don't know. Um, but yeah, all, all of it is it's temporary concerns and it's yeah it's it's roadblocks along the way, but it's it's nothing that could. Uh, Bitcoin is inevitable. That, that that's what I want to say. Yeah, the cat is out of the bag. Um, so Chris, um, yeah. let me just a uh, final question before we wrap up. And then I want to ask you, like, like you know, how, where people can find you. Um, w- you know, there's a lot of talk about, about citadels, free private cities, people, you know, um, because of this whole madness of lockdown and uh, planned forced uh, or mandatory vaccinations, all this bullshit that's been going on. Um, uh, you know, a lot of talk about migration or, you know, migrating to another country, to another jurisdiction. Uh, do you see this like accelerating or, or is that something you, you've considered yourself? Because I mean, I, I, we, do, we do actually, you know, uh, where, where's your position on that? It's a very good question. And I think as a Bitcoiner, you kind of have to be open minded. Um, however, and yeah, I, I love Citadel theory. I love seeing it um, even just as a, not just as a thought experiment. I love like um, people who are, like wanting to make it happen through like regenerative al- agriculture and stuff like that. Untapped growth has been talking about that a lot recently on Bitcoin Twitter, been on a few podcasts and he's rightly getting a lot of love. Um, so yeah, I do, I remain open-minded. However, um, I think a lot of the migration narrative is shaped. Um, a lot of the discourse within Bitcoin is shaped by us, uh, American people, American Bitcoiners. Um, And I think within the American identity is the idea of migration because it's like the frontier. Um, They, you know, US gradually moved, they settled on the East Coast and gradually moved West, uh, colonizing and uh, and settling uh, the areas that they tamed, I guess. Um, So yeah, I think I don't think that's a coincidence. I, I think like, yeah, it's quite a, an American thing to think I don't like it here. I'll just move on. It's, it's the it's the way the frontier mentality has shaped their culture and the way they think. Um, I kind of don't you have to stay open minded, but I don't like it from a uh, my default position is to want to stay where I am, invest in my local community uh you know ride out whatever comes and uh come out stronger for it um you know I, i'm involved with a local sports club at the moment just as a player but in in the future i'd like to uh, get involved with coaching and maybe like you know leading the i, I see the people who like you know the the executive committee or whatever who lead the club they're just volunteers who see the value of this thing uh for the local community and see it as their duty and responsibility to help it to thrive i like that way of thinking about my local community um and yeah it, it would take a lot for me to just up sticks and move and not least because my family are here um However, I have moved moved abroad before. As I said, I've lived in Moscow. Um, in my head, that was always a temporary thing. But I, I guess as a Bitcoin, you have to be open to it. So, yeah, I'm, I'm open to it. But I, I do see moving as something as an e- easy way out. It, it may become necessary. But uh, I think ultimately, I would rather stay where I am, invest in my local community and, and yeah, I think about it that way. That's my default position, if that makes sense. Um, but yeah, I pay attention to things like um, which jurisdictions are most kind of Bitcoin friendly as 
as we all should. And yeah, I do look at those th- sorts of things and it, it, I would never uh, rule it out, you know? Yeah, yeah, I'm pretty much on the same page like you. I mean, I'd rather prefer, you know, to invest something in a localized economy or something local, you know, like, uh, grow. you know, we're going to uh, move to the countryside pretty soon and have, you know, some, maybe some cows and pigs. And <laughs> so yeah. it's going to be, yeah, it's going to be very adventurous, I guess, you know, to live because I'm, I'm used to like living in the city. But um, yeah, I know, uh, Chris, thanks so much again for your time. I, I really had a blast. It was a fascinating talk. Is, I know you have a YouTube channel. Is there, are you planning to write articles or write a book? I mean, this is, I have this vision, like you sitting with Robert Breedlove, Jordan Peterson and, and Weinstein at Rojo Rogan, and really like, like finally educating people and, and enlightening people once, you know, all of them have done their own homework and, uh, you know, started comprehending the, the power, the essence, you know, the fundamentals of Bitcoin. So where can people find you? Any, any final thoughts? Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. This has been a great conversation, a great way to start the week. Yeah, I guess. Uh, so yeah, I'm on Twitter at Chris Espley one. Uh, I'm on YouTube. Uh, my handle is Chris Espley. Um, I've recently, so I had, uh, I was using a service for video editing um, and I've recently changed it. I, I wasn't particularly happy with certain elements. So yeah, I'm, I'm looking for new video editors. Uh, I'll get, I found, I found a few via Upwork, which I like the, the look of. Um, so yeah, my, my YouTube is, uh, it, it'll probably be quiet for another week or so. Um, but yeah, I've, I've got like uh, stuff filmed and stuff written. Uh, so I'll, I'll, my aim is to get to a point where I can create two good quality videos per week, all aimed towards educating people about Bitcoin in a way that, that fits the YouTube medium. Yeah. In terms of like articles and, and books, I've got, I've got a lot of stuff written and I, I think I've kind of been overthinking it with regards to where to publish. And I think what I'm going to start doing, you know, if it's good enough for some of my favorite Bitcoin writers like Breedlove and Nick Carter, um, then I'll, I'll just start putting them on medium. Um, so yeah, I do, I need to do that more regularly. Um, I've got a lot of stuff as just like Twitter threads. Yeah. You can um, just compile them to articles. And, that would be great. Yeah. 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 And pe- people have asked me before. Um, but yeah, I guess I've kind of, I'm at the beginning of my journey in terms of like being a bit more public and, and what have you for advocacy and what have you of Bitcoin. So, um, yeah, I guess uh, maybe maybe one day I'll write a book. Definitely. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> yeah. But in the short term, it'll be tweets, it'll be YouTube videos, and and in medium term, maybe like more yeah, more articles and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, at Chris Espley one on Twitter and uh, YouTube, uh, just Chris Espley E S P L E Y. Um, but yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, I, I love I love just uh, getting to talk about about Bitcoin and its implications. So thanks for giving me this platform, Kayvan. Um, no, Chris, thanks so much for doing everything, you know, and, and putting up, you know, some brilliant content. I really enjoy this and so many others. Um, yeah, so I hope we can, you know, repeat this maybe as a panel discussion. Who knows, maybe with Chris, uh, Jeff Booth in the future, in six months or some time, you know, in the future. So thanks much again and hope to talk to you soon. Thanks, mate. See you again soon. Bye, Chris. Bye-bye. Okay, that was a... Uh, beautiful talk and really enjoyed this so many facets to talk about so this is why you know i want to talk with chris espley you should definitely you know watch uh, this this three or three and a half hour talk with robert breedlove where they go into all kinds of you know rabbit holes of bitcoin uh, and you know i had some specific fundamental questions or or, or topics which i wanted to talk to, to him about and that's what i did so we finally made it uh, make sure you follow Chris Espley on Twitter, on YouTube. And if you have any questions, let me know if you have any suggestions for future talks or panel discussions. Make sure you follow me on Twitter, subscribe to my YouTube channel and my podcast platforms, which is distributed on all you know well-known podcast platforms. It's the Cave on the Vani connection. And yeah, thanks so much. If you have any suggestions, let me know. My email address is kd at cavandavani.com or you can DM me on Twitter, LinkedIn, uh, Telegram. Thanks so much again, and I'll see you soon. Bye.